Yeah. Our next presenter is uh, Rupert Young, who has come to us all the way from yeah. over the water yeah. to the white in England <coughs> and uh, has done really nice things with robotics and wants to show us some of those things. I don't know if you've got any robots in your suitcase, but uh, oh, they're on the table. Yeah. So we will see live demonstrations and videos, and this is going to be real fun. Okay, thank you. It's uh, fantastic to be here in the United States of America, the second greatest <laughs> country in the world. Second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's also good to be in the it's Chicago area, area, which I've never mm -hmm. been to before. And we hear a lot about Chicago in popular culture and movies that sometimes feel like a mythical or fictional city. So it's good to see that it's actually real. <laughs> well, does anyone know what the uh, shaded area is? Uh, it's purple. <laughs> it's purple. Yeah. It is purple, yes. Yeah. Well done. Uh, it's um, in Illinois' third congressional district, mm. which I'll uh, come back to. Jerry uh, uh, Leonard. Uh, so one of the reasons I'm excited to be in this area is because Chicago is the setting of one of my favorite movies. Um, now I love movies, um, but I'm not really into Hollywood blockbusters. I like more sort of arty, independent films. Um, and there's three things I look for in a movie. Uh, a good plot, good music, and no car chases. <laughs> now, the film I'm thinking of, the plot is pretty weak has the most absurd car chases you've ever seen in movies, but it's got fantastic music. And it is, of course, this is my... the Blue One, two, yeah. and now, what about the film. Do the next one, Taylor! What about the Blue Yeah, no, no, I don't know. Anything I want to do, I'm going to enjoy the rest of this movie. And this evening, I'm... We're going down to the south side of Chicago, going up to random strangers, and asking them to show them how to do the boogaloo. That should be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amusing to see the mockery of the Nazis, but I was wondering what on earth is that going to do with Chicago? I thought it was just some random inclusion. Uh, but oh no, since I decided to include the Bruce Brothers in this a few months ago, I found out a lot of interesting things of which I was entirely ignorant beforehand. And the, the depiction of the Nazis is actually a satirization of something that happened only a stone throw from here in Stokely, uh, which is a mile or two away when in 1978 the American Nazi Party tried to hold a rally there. Do people know about this? Sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. okay. yeah. um, <coughs> now the, the picture on the right is not from the film, that's a real picture, hmm. and the guy on the left in that picture is a guy called Arthur J. Jones, and earlier this year he stood in the Republican primary in the Illinois <laughs> Third Congressional District, which is a shady area. Um, and would anyone like to guess what percentage of the vote that he got? 30. 30? <coughs> Five. 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 <laughs> like, nice to 30. Like, sure well, it, it was 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody voting against him? Huh? Well, that's it. He was the only candidate. <laughs> and now the Republican Party denounced him, but how was it that he was the only candidate? We still got 20,000 votes, but maybe people didn't realise what's happening. <coughs> and presumably, I'm not quite sure how the system works here, but I guess there's next month, is it? There's the actual election where he mm. voted, and presumably he will lose against the Democrat. Presumably. That's hopefully not. Yeah, he would have been the bad. And there's a picture of him today. Now, there was a very similar picture with him smiling, but he looked like a friendly old grandpa. <laughs> that only took my preconceptions of what nasty Nazis look like, so I chose one where he's looking a bit more mean and sinister. Now, this is where I live. Not in that house, though. 
up and down, the wind is up, it's just the left hand side. Where are you? Is that a lot of traffic here? Right? There I am. <laughs> you may have heard about a little wedding we had yeah. Yeah. There recently. Wow. It was a, it was a wonderful day. Yeah. Where did they park? Wonderful to see the uh, peasants live their lives vicariously through the ruling <laughs> elite of which they haven't hope in hell of ever being a member. Now, you, you might not know the real reason for the wedding, so I'll let you into a secret. It's part of our post-Brexit strategy. We can be out of the European Union on our own, so we can be screwed. So only, our only hope is to rebuild the British Empire and take back our former colonies. <laughs> <laughs> so the plan is for Meghan Markle, who's an American citizen, to run for president in 2020. <laughs> and when she wins, the Fagotus, the first gentleman of the United States, will be Prince Harry. So, so once again, the family of George III will rule over the Americas. <laughs> I'm told the Americans love a royal family. <laughs> you've, got so scenario. you've got Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. That, that'll make me move to Canada. <coughs> I'll move to Canada if that happens. Yeah. <laughs> that, you do that, right? yeah. Canada's already there. Uh, yeah, so, anytime I want to feel joy, I watch the Blues Brothers. People who. Uh, think in a prejudiced or racist way, act in such a way as to maintain that view of themselves or the world and other people. And people whose identity is wrapped up in sort of nationalistic sentiments uh, seek out activities that uh, enable them to express and maintain that way of looking at themselves. But I'm here to talk about the bodies. <laughs> um, so my background, I did a degree in artificial intelligence. And it was quite an interesting degree because it had three parts to it. One was the computing with AI, one was cognitive psychology, and one was philosophy of the mind. So I think it gave me a better, uh, a deeper way of questioning the nature of behavior and intelligence, which you wouldn't normally get in a standard computer science AI course. Then I did a PhD in robotics, which is where I came across except for control theory. But now I went to work out in commercial IT for 15 years as a, in the uh, systems integration area. For the last few years, I've been trying to get back into applying central control theory to robotics. And I uh, wrote a paper which was published in the Artificial Life Journal last year, which is there. And I, I, I wrote the paper while I was cycling down the west coast of India from Mumbai to the southern tip, Kanyu Kumari. And that's a picture of me uh, arriving. Um, it took a bit longer than a paper would normally take, but it was a great way to write a paper. Um, uh, but I'm showing off a bit now, which is not very British. <laughs> Just don't tell the Queen. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, a bit about the robotics market and its potential. Uh, an overview of perceptual control theory, and some examples. Uh, introduce some of the conventional approaches to robotics, and then some robotics based on perceptual control theory. So the robotics market is currently about $45 billion a year globally, uh, expected to rise to about $100 billion in 2025. And the biggest segment is industrial robots, which is basically robot arms in factories. There's some other sectors which are coming up, uh, expected to grow the higher rate, uh, professional robots, and then the consumer robots like vacuum cleaners and lawnmowers. But these are all really, the main focus of these is really in predictable, controlled environments. And not, it hasn't really broken out into the real world and dynamic environments, which is what perceptual control theory is more, perceptual control theory is more suited to. 
so this is a graphic of the number of robots per 10,000 employees for different countries. And at the top there you have South Korea at 630-ish. The US is lagging a bit at 189. And a very disappointing United Kingdom on 71 behind Australia even. Here's some random figures. Robot arms cost around 10,000 to 100,000 pounds. And the annual sales of them are around 190,000 a year. And the number of industrial robots in the world is expected to rise from 1.6 to 2.6 million, uh, with a value of 11 to 18 billion. China is investing very heavily in robotics. One area alone, Guangdong, is investing $150 billion in robotics. But they are mainly sort of industrial robot arms. But manufacturing itself globally is nearly $13 trillion. So at the moment, robotics is only less than 1% of that figure. So there's huge potential for robotics to grow in the future. Now, robotics based on perceptual control is quite an early technology readiness level of about two or three, which is on scale to nine. So to progress it, um, we need to find funding. And here's a couple of funding applications which I'm involved in at the moment. It's the Amazon Research Awards, it's quite a small one, $80,000. I'm doing that in association with Warren Mansell from Manchester. <coughs> And we submitted that application, but we don't find out until January. A much bigger one is for 3 million euros, which is the Horizon 2020 program, part of the European Union uh, funding program for innovation. And the particular call, the title is called Challenging Current Thinking. And the criteria for it are that it has a radical vision, breakthrough technological target, and to be interdisciplinary research. And we think that the self control theory applied to robots fits this very well. But I think we do have a challenge there of trying to explain why the central control, the control theory in robotics is different from existing paradigms. And I think there's a problem we have there because feedback control systems, PID controllers, for example, are quite prevalent uh, within robotics. So I think we need, uh, so, well, we will make suggestions of how to uh, communicate this uh, in this sort of concept of challenging current thinking. Now, for this particular program, it requires a consortium of organizations from three different European countries. So at the moment, we're looking for um, <clears throat> other European partners. And we've had expressions of interest for about 26 different organizations at the moment. So we're considering those at the moment. But for the actual project for this, we're thinking of building up and incrementally the capabilities of different robotic systems with the end goal of a humanoid type, type robot that can stand up, balance, walk around, and perform tasks. We'd expect each of the incremental stages to potentially be prototypes in their own right for different robotic systems that work in dynamic environments based on conceptual control. Okay, so the conventional way of robotics is seen as a basically a sort of perceive, plan, execute type of processing pipeline with a sort of plan or model in the middle which um, from which is computed the actions which are expected to uh, perform some task. And within this, the model or the plan I'd include neural networks, reinforcement learning, learning from demonstration, model based control. And there might be some closing of the loop by uh, iteratively repeating what it's doing or to verify the performance or the output of the system. 
and I fit all these into the sort of computational approach which uh, Bruce mentioned yesterday as well. But this we see as a sort of misconception of what behaviour um, is all about. Behaviour is actually about um, acting in the world in order to uh, perceive it the way you want it to be. Um, so it's a closed loop feedback system uh, where you have a, a desired perception and you have a current perception. The difference between the two produces an error which um, sort of drives the output which affects through the world the perception uh, that you want to bring into line with the desired perception. So in this concept you can't really, or it doesn't really make much sense to separate out perception and action, which is the way it's done in the conventional approaches. So, so you're saying when I look at the robots on the Tesla assembly line that are soldering and everything, they're not looking where the car is, they're not using feedback, they don't have sensory capabilities to adjust their positions? Positions. Uh, generally not, no. Really? Posi positions totally predictable. Yeah, they're all you know, highly precision sense. engineering, highly calibrated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are systems now, they aren't trying to sort of introduce um, feedback, visual feedback, things, but generally on production lines, I don't think they have any mm. feedback. They're all pre-programmed, uh, and they have to, the way they achieve it, it's got its precision engineering, moving to exact positions. So the other side, look at it, an autonomous car as a robot, clearly that has to be PCT. Well, kind of sort of. They better have perception. <laughs> yeah, it does, and I'll come on to okay, it. It's on the in a minute, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we've got quite a uh, long period for this, <coughs> so we can have questions and discussions with you along. But if CSG nets everything to do by then, I might regret saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's good to go through, I, I like to go through examples of, of, of perception controls, of, for me anyway, it's a better understanding of what's, what's going on. So here's some, here's some examples, um, and you can tell me whether you agree with them or not. So the, the iris in the eye opens and closes in order to control and maintain a uh, constant amount of light on the retina. When we're going to pick up an object, we're controlling the visual relationship between our hand and an object. When we're speaking face to face with someone, we're controlling the separation between us at a level which is comfortable to us. And different, different people will have uh, different levels which are comfortable to them. And you may have had the experience of someone being a bit too close in your face and you find yourself having to back away without trying to make it feel too obvious. And if not, then maybe you're the one that's too close. <laughs> um, at a high level, we control the sequences of things such as the uh, letters in the word, in a word, or the toppings that go on a pizza. We control things that happen over extended periods of time, events, like catching train or giving a presentation. At even higher level, we control more abstract things, such as our sense of honesty, which we might do by robbing or not robbing a bank. Um, <coughs> I'm going to go through some examples of things that might be uh, controlled on a typical day. So, the water temperature we feel in the shower, brownness of toast, lip colour, hairiness of face, speed of car relationship between height of chair and desk, rights to the computer screen, number of answered emails and inbox, cohesion of work team, the pressure of things on a keyboard, looking like Kim Kardashian by having cosmetic surgery. <laughs> Someone's actually doing that apparently. Uh, your position with a company, being within the European Union or not, what to have for lunch, feeling of intoxication, gender equality, the feeling of laughter, number of children, business ethics, tidiness of a desk, personal identity. I could go on and on. These are all um, variables which we can perceive and potentially control. And for each there will be a goal uh, that we want to reach. So for hairiness of face, for example, for one person the goal might be very hairy, for another clean shaven. And you might have a different goal depending on whether it's a Sunday or a Monday. 
So there's hundreds or millions of perceptions being controlled at any one point in time, some lasting only moments, others a lifetime. I think when you think about it, goals have to be perceptual in nature, as that is the only way that we experience the world. Perception is the only way we can tell we're achieving something. of their position, perhaps, despite very strong forces. Measuring the wind speed. Uh, so it's the easier way to measure the wind speed. But. Anyway, so he, he's doing it. Um, he doesn't need to know what the force is that is coming against him, but he adjusts his muscles in order to maintain his perception of his position. Here's a great uh, model here that some of you are familiar with. Um, so the normal way of um, modeling, sort of catching a baseball within robotics might be to uh, try and detect the position of the ball, work out its trajectory, uh, predict where the ball's going to land, and sort of plan that the path that the field has to run to catch the ball. So on the left here, it shows the path of the baseball and the path of the fielder. And Whereas the, the plan method would predict a straight line path for the runner. Uh, yes. So uh, as you see here, the path of the fielder takes doesn't initially might go in the wrong direction, which is the way real fielders do it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. But one of these graphs is very linear. linear. The, the retinal image. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That, I did it because the original studies where they looked at what was on the retina it looked like that. that it, mm -hmm. The ball does make a, a, a almost straight line uh, mm -hmm. image on the retina, mm -hmm. at least uh, when it's a uh, that kind of parabolic trajectory, but I told him, when I met the guy who did it, I told him, try it with frisbees. And I have, have a, and he did, he had dogs catching frisbees while they were wearing a camera. And it turns out that the retinal trace then, and I have a demo of it, is, is not like it curves, but they still catch it. <laughs> And so does the model. The model image curves too. Okay. So, so the way this, this is done is simply by the control of vertical and horizontal optical velocities of the ball on the retina. Um, and there's no uh, prediction or computations of trajectories. Hmm. And so I was trying to think of a, you know, I, I'm not sure whether people actually grasp this when, uh, when they hear about it. So I've come up with a sort of one-dimensional explanation for it. So if I imagine I'm standing here, I'm looking at the wall across there, uh, and I'm looking at a fixed point. <clears throat> now imagine there's a, a ball going across the wall, or you can think of a stream of balls. So the ball is going at a certain speed, and it will trace a path across my retina. And I will sort of detect that as some sort of change within the retina. So it's sort of um, change which is a sort of speed related to the speed of the ball, but not the direct measurement um, of the speed of the ball. So let's say that value is 10. <clears throat> now if I start moving to the right-hand side, then that value is going to get less. So the difference in speed between myself and the ball will reduce. So if I keep speeding up, going this way, um, until that value is zero, then I will uh, be matching the speed of the ball, and I can just pick it off the wall. Does that sound like a valid-ish explanation of in one dimension? Yes. You have a reference for having the velocity that you perceive be zero. And so you yeah. keep that, make that happen by moving in proportion to the speed of the ball. Yeah. What about learning, uh, like, professional baseball player or uh, Training, right, to improve their 
catching a bit of this. Oh, yeah. So how we learning in the PCD framework learn? Are you trying to get more familiar with adjusting their optical flow or are they just practicing to get something else? Like this that. is a model of a fielder who's already learned how to catch balls, and so he's and so what learning is in control PCT is you're learning the control systems, which means you've got to learn what variables to perceive, so that so the fielder probably children learn at the beginning that you, that, that they control that optical variable. They don't know they're doing it, but that's what they're doing. So they learn to perceive the optical variable, and they learn how to, uh, what, how to move, and that's the output function, how to move in order to keep that variable at, at the reference of zero. So that's what we've learned. Um, uh, I guess uh, fielders, uh, <laughs> to the extent that you can improve it, uh, that would probably mainly involve building up the output function, just getting stronger, getting being able to move faster and stuff. But uh, actually, it's kind of interesting because the PCT would say, once you've got a functioning control system in place that works, um, letting, you know, trying to make it better will probably screw you up. Yeah. Uh, but your body is changing on an indoor change. It's always changing, but uh, yes, and reorganization, well, uh, reorganization is probably based, uh, has a, this consciousness component, and so, uh, like, and so, if, once you're skilled at something, like catching balls or playing the piano, what you want to do is keep consciousness out of it. Yeah. You want to... But he's asking about the learning process. I can throw a little anecdote or something with that. And, and what I hear you asking is, with somebody who doesn't know how to catch a ball very well, could you direct their attention to this yeah, variable? Exactly. Yeah. Can you speed up their learning yeah. phases by So yeah. the, the anecdotal bit is about this guy, Tony Robbins, you've probably heard of. And, and yeah. Yeah. Maybe you dislike what he does, maybe you like it. But I remember his description of uh, <coughs> learning how to be a marksman with a rifle. Yes. Going to a marksman and saying, what perceptions do I need to, to, to be mindful of? What perceptions do I need? He's literally saying, what perceptions yeah. do I need to control? What perceptions are you controlling when you do that? Exactly. And that's, a, that's an approach to training. And it worked for him, and he says it works. So that's anecdotal. Right. And uh, yeah. my son was a tennis coach for a while. And uh, he, um, he actually, I helped him. I think I helped him. Said, tell, I told him it, it makes more sense to tell the person what they're supposed to feel rather than what they're supposed to do. Right. But even more common than that is people, they got to keep doing it, practicing over and over to develop muscle memory. I love that term. Yeah. yeah. I like, okay, okay. <laughs> that, Turn that people off. People call things, it's not, not exactly what they're doing. Are we digressing from robotics enough? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Do you have a question? No, I just had a comment which is sort of related to this. I remember that when I went to Australia and I was having to drive on the other side of the road, uh -huh. right? Oh. What really helped... No, left, left. On the other side of the road, <laughs> the <other side. laughs> not the left. <laughs> and we do here. One thing that really helped, right, it's, is Judy McFadden said to me, in the U.S., the driver is always closest to the other car. Huh. She said, as the driver, you're closest to the oncoming traffic. Oh, and she said, it's the right. same here. Right, right. And so once in a robot, if I knew what to control for, right, I had the correct goal or the right perception <coughs> to be controlling, or I was trying to learn something, it, I could take all of my past learning and very quickly shift it. I've seen driving yeah. videos where they just intuitively do that. They tell you what to perceive. Yeah, stay exactly. Okay. Um, okay. So with, with this this model, um, it shows how this task can be achieved without any sort of prediction and um, complex mathematics or computing trajectories. Mm. And of course, the power of perceptual uh, control theory comes from how systems are arranged in a hierarchy, 
where you're going uh, up the hierarchy, perceptions at each level are combinations of perceptions from lower levels. And coming down the hierarchy, the reference goals at each level are combinations or outputs from the previous level. And they're not specifying what to do, but they're specifying what to perceive. And it applies to all types and levels of behavior. That's the theory. And so at the lowest level, we have things like intensities. So sound, for example, which you can control by turning the volume knob on a stereo. In the middle, we might have uh, relationships between things such as the robot is on the table. And at a higher level, more abstract things like um, political systems or religious ideologies. I like that. Very good. Good choice. Yep. Yeah. Now, how would you like your dinner to be cooked by a robot? You're so screaming at everyone wow. in the kitchen. Swearing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that that's wonderful. But that is of course a promotional video. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> fantasy. Uh, the reality is very different. <laughs> So it's trying to um, replicate the exact motions that a chef did to, ke to cook a particular recipe. And it, you know, it works to some extent, but uh, as Rick said, all the ingredients, utensils have to be precisely placed by the humans who are controlling the environment. And if anything is out of place, then the whole thing goes haywire. And also the consequences of what it does is not exactly the same as no. what and it's, it spills some because so it, it, it has no visual some. feedback to something stuck on the spatula. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I can't uh, believe they're actually, are they building anything? Well, they were trying to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, that, was, yeah. that was the real robot you saw there. But I think even to take you know, from the motion capture of the real chef to producing the motion of the robot, they had to do a lot of tweaking sure. to get it to actually. Yeah. Through and the action. poor chef has to wear these heavy gloves, you know, okay. that's going to affect his movements. Uh, yeah, and as far as I know, all it has managed to cook is this crab beast, which is basically a soup. And as you may have seen in the video, the mixture of the soup itself was pre-prepared by humans and the uh -huh. robot just tipped it into the sauce. And it was uh -huh. Yeah, all the ingredients uh -huh. in the cup. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the real work. Now, 
that, that robot chef you might think is you know, some sort of commercial application of, uh, with a methodology that is a bit suspect. But I think it's also the same sort of approach is used in actual serious research. And here's an example which I think sort of typifies the approach within robotics research. So this is a robot arm that's doing the cup and ball task. So it's got a ball on a string and it's going like this to um, uh, throw the cup, uh, throw the ball up into the cup. Um, And as you can see, the cup is uh, quite big, quite a lot larger than the ball. But it's the real thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the, it's virtually the same size. It's quite difficult to do, actually. Right. Anyway. Hey. And so the, the way this is done in, in this particular piece of research. So it starts with sort of learning from the demonstration. So again, it's taking uh, the actions of a real person is doing to do the task. And then it's sort of breaking those, the, the movements down into lots of, lots of bits and bits, which is called motion primitives. Uh, and these are sort of parameterized um, to include uh, parameters related to the environment, such as the, the stream length. Now, when they um, did this and initially, the motions or movements they took from the real person it, it didn't work on the robot, so they had to optimize it, which they did with reinforcement learning. And the reward function, which you can see here, <coughs> Uh, they had an external <coughs> camera looking at the scene, and for the reward function, they used the distance between the ball and the rim of the cup, and the time that the ball crossed the rim of the crop, cropped cup with a downward motion. So they used those to adjust the parameters of the, of the motion. So they didn't put the camera in the robot? So they, they, well, with this research, they found they were able, the purpose of it was to try and do a model which generalized the situation. And they found that they could sort of generalize to some extent the string length of two or three centimeters. But if they needed to change the uh, string of the length much more than that, then they had to go into the model itself and change one of the parameters within the model. So I think this. The generalization, though, it seems to me that you know, that's sort of dependent on the size of the, the cup. So if the, big, the bigger the cup is, then the sort of more generalization could be done. So whether it's anything to do with the model itself it seems a bit uh, suspect to me. Um, within the model, there's sort of two degrees of freedom that the robot arm is moving in. And they had 55 kernels or sections, motion primitives for each degree of freedom. So they were saying they had 110 parameters which they were optimizing <coughs> in the model. I think it was a lot more than that, actually, because they, for each of the um, kernels, they had these uh, sort of five more, five or so parameters there. So I think it may, may be more. They were saying it was 110 parameters. <coughs> so I was, uh, emailed them. So this, you know, it doesn't seem a reasonable way, I think, from what we know about perceptual control as a way of doing things. Although, to some extent, this reward function is, they are doing some sort of perceptual control there by changing the trends, because they are, uh, the reward function which they're um, expressing is a sort of perceptual control, a perceptual function. But if, if we were doing from a perceptual control point of view, I think we do it differently. We sort of break it down into lots of different goals and sub goals. So, <clears throat> for the real task, we probably want to see that the ball is moving from side to side. We want to get the ball above the, the rim of the cup and get it so that the 
So we'd increase, what, we'd increase our motions in order to achieve the goals that we're trying to uh, perform for the task. And we want to get the ball up so that it's, the ball is slowing down and it's above the cup so it falls into the cup. So we break things down into... <laughs> well, then it's like catching a fly ball. Rick knows how to do that, right? Well, there'll be elements of the yeah. same perception. That would be a cool exercise. Did you do it? Um, <laughs> unfortunately not. I don't have the resources to do so, but um, if you have any funding, let me know. <laughs> right, who's going to pay for that? Yeah, so I wanted to say a quick word about learning, particularly reinforcement learning. Now, I'm not an expert on it, but these are some observations that I've made. So as I understand the concept is that uh, the reward ha or reinforcer has some sort of causal effect, or supposed to have some sort of causal effect on the actual behavior. So they believe. So the food pellets are causing the present <coughs> behaviors, which doesn't really make sense to me. Um, the implication of this is that the more reward there is and the more behavior, but that's not what is found, it's found in real experiments. Behavior reaches a limit. And this is sort of fudged within reinforcement learning, I think, by um, squashing things into a probability function. So it's between 0 and 1, so it's going to go higher than, higher than 1 in terms of yeah, the behavior. That, maybe you can take all sure. And the, the rats have to be starved. Uh, for the experiments to work, which shouldn't really make sense within the concept of reinforcement learning. And the, the organization changes within the system, continues as long as there's a reward present. So I think this is a sort of like a folk psychology understanding of what behavior and learning is all about, and it's better understood as a con control or perceptual control process where the uh, the subject, the rat, actually has a, a goal for a, um, a desire for food. And as I think somebody mentioned yesterday, the rate at which the food is taken is at a constant rate, so that's the sort of what is controlled. And the, within this concept, the organization changes only occurs when there's error within, within the system. And if there's error, the system, the subject, the rat might just do random explorations until it finds something that uh, enables it to achieve its goal of getting food. So, so this, can you think of a better answer to Frederick? Um, okay, so once you've achieved the, once you've got a skill at a certain level, um, you, if you want to get better, that would mean, I think, another system would have to be able to perceive uh, how successful you are. So it might be, it might perceive how you know how often you're catching the ball. Uh, so that's a kind of a sophisticated perception. But so let's say you want to the higher level perception wants you to have 100 percent rather than 99.9. .9, uh, then it would that then that system uh, would. You would, would start that system would have an error, which would start reorganization because that's that's what the learning uh, process is is in fact uh, set off by when there's error and when there's persistent error in the control system. Presumably, uh, then then you start reorganizing. Could it be that you keep trying also learning because you're not really aware of what you're I think you, uh, well, right, you're not really right. You don't, that, yeah, our, the reorganization process <coughs> control theory is, is random because it doesn't know what to do. Uh, right, uh, that's, uh, there's a good article on that, actually, uh, a philosophical article. Uh, Hugh Petrie uh, wrote something about that. It, it's kind of a paradox of learning. I mean, you, you, it, learning is tough because you don't know what it is you're supposed to do, especially in physical sports and like, uh, athletics, it's uh, you don't really know. You don't know how you're supposed to vary your muscle tensions in order to get these things done right. So yeah, right. But I think it is conscious. You are. You do consciously do things like, uh, okay, I can. 
play the piano at this level, now I want to do concert piano level. So that's a higher level system saying that this isn't good enough, that there, there's error for me up there. And so, but, that, but still, the process of change, what you have to change about your technique to make you concert pianist, you, you don't know what it is. So. I mean, it seems you know what you're like, you're not aware of what you're like learning or like controlling, but you can clearly say like for any expert when you're like looking at a, a novice or like a beginner, you can write right or just seeing like moving, do you, you know that he's like he's not good at that? Whatever. Right, like right. Activity. You know you're not yes. But you don't really know right. exactly what it is why. You don't you're know like, why. Like just, right. just, you're like now at, uh, I mean you, I bet you can catch a ball really well yeah. and I I never I I was amazed <laughs> to know that what I'm doing when I catch a ball is controlling the vertical velocity, or trying to keep the ball constant. I mean, the ball's moving. <laughs> I thought, what, what am I? And uh, yeah, it, I, a lot of times we don't know what perception we're, we're controlling or how we control it, really, once we get there. Bruce, where is that? <clears throat> Someone with a background in scenario and output conditioning, I would have to say that your reinforcement description here is Hopefully incorrect, but uh, we could have that discussion else. But I have other time. Well, one particular point: the rats don't have to be starved. Uh, they love chocolate milk, for example, and uh, any kind of treat like that they'll go for. It. So they need to have they need to have a goal for it. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so I think. Things like reinforcement learning, which is very popular at the moment, needs to be revisited um, and maybe uh, converted into more of a uh, perceptual control learning process. Sorry, but in some reinforcement learning, you can also have some okay. reward or goals that are very, very abstract in the same sense as like okay. a control variable. Like if you're like trying to get your way out of a maze, if you just have like trying to minimize the time you get out, like some system can just learn to do it pretty well. And it's, it's like, a, like a variable which is very like far away from the getting out of the maze itself, right? It's not higher level, no, it's just the time to do it. The, the, the reward, like the way, I mean, all the reinforcement learning, it seems to, is, is, is cast about how you choose your reward. Like, depending on how you, 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 which kind of action you're rewarding, you might just end up completely like doing a, another thing. That's the kind of the, the black magic of reinforcement learning. It's all about finding what the reward you're like. What are you rewarding? And many programs are like completely are very difficult because people don't know what to reward at all. Or they, you are trying, but like for uh, yeah. I mean, in artificial system, not in a, the way it might be uh, learning, uh, working on other systems. Well, you know, I think with reinforcement learning, there are some there is some overlap. With Set controlled way of looking at things. So with the rewards, you could look at those as perceptual goals. I think it's just a matter of maybe a sort of reframing some of the concepts of reinforcement within the concept uh, in the framework of perceptual control. Because um, I think there there are sort of problems within the um, reinforcement learning. Paradigm. But yeah, because it's true that you're like more rewarding the, the actions or the output, not in the, the other way, like, which is in the input or the perceptual. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not aware of any experiments yeah. with you. And, and with the perceptual control approach is breaking things down into the hierarchy as well, lots of sub goals, so I think it makes the um, problem easier if you're able to do that. But you know, I, this is an area which I'd really like to do more work on, or develop in the learning systems within uh, a, a perceptual controlled context and people were talking about research priorities yesterday and for me with, within robotics at the moment to build robotic systems we have to sort of manually uh, work out or manually try what control variables are going to be but if we can do put learning into it so the system learns itself what the control variables are then you know you can make things a lot easier and advance much more than we are at the moment. Uh, my observation, at least from the, the little that I know about reward or reinforcement learning, is that oftentimes they're 
I mean, uh, Fred kind of alluded to this before too. You have to actually complete the action before you get any reinforcement for that. So perceptual control or like real control systems, it's all online, everything's happening at the same time, right? Yeah. And reinforcement learning, you have to actually finish that loop before you can loop through Yes. That. Yeah. yeah. For example, like the Go, you know, like everyone has heard about AlphaGo, like from Google, um, that like the, the game of Go, so like the very complicated games. And uh, the reward in that case was just uh, plus or minus one if you win or lose. And they were trying to reassign, which is like called the credit assignment problem. They're trying to reassign what kind of sequence of actions lead to that thing and reward the action back uh, the, the on time. But you need like a really like a, a tremendous amount of trials to do that. It's not something you can just uh, do on the fly. Yeah. It's really about selection of what behavior will allow you to establish control over certain areas. Uh, and, it, and it's really been likened to Darwinian evolution. You have variation in behavior, other disturbances and other sorts of things, and other things that the individual's controlling. And then you have selection based upon what works. Uh, yeah. So those behaviors that seem to get you toward your goal or to your goal tend to be retained in the system, and those that don't tend to be reduced in the likelihood that they will occur in the future. And the result ultimately is very efficient behavior. Yeah. Well, I just talk to you more about that. Yeah. So we have a learning working group on the net that has not uh, communicated much in some time, but that is a focus that's been identified. And I think you're a member of that group. Yeah, I started it and I haven't done anything, so <laughs> yeah. I just haven't had the time to do it. But I, something I would like to do more. Um, okay, so. With this sort of motion capture paradigm, there's quite a bit of research from this. So it, this is real-time motion capture of what a human is doing and replaying it on a robot. Now, so one application of this is to try and uh, remotely control robots in real time. But it's also seen as a serious uh, investigation into uh, autonomous control of robotic systems. That's based on visual of video of the yeah. human? Yeah. So it's motion capture also humans doing the actions and then replaying those on, on the robot. But to me, this seems just like sort of, uh, replicating the motions of, of the person in a sort of automaton like sort of way. Uh, and the, the system itself is not doing any uh, feedback. This is basically like the, uh, the one of the first industrial robots to do that, where it just had this long arm that could extend out and then it could move in different directions. And you put it into a training mode, and the trainer then put it through specific motions, and its memory simply recorded those motions and played them back to execute. <coughs> yeah, I just want to sort of introduce a little historical note here. Um, you know, this sounds to me like uh, what was called time and motion studies by Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, now, this goes back to the origins of the factory system in the beginning of the 20th century. And um, uh, so, uh, Taylor, uh, Ford, for example, uh, it was also called Fordism. It was called scientific management. It was called Fordism. Um, but Ford adopted this. This was his big uh, breakthrough with the, you know, producing the Model T. So the, the assembly line was based on Frederick Winslow Taylor's time and motion studies, where he would basically look at the way workers were, you know, making cars, and, and, and then do exactly this. And then they took that knowledge and they put it into an assembly line. I, I, don't, I don't see what, they're, what, what these folks are doing is any different from what they've been doing for 100 years. Am I, am I missing something? Yeah, the robots. No, but, the, but, but, but they're not really robots. That's the point. In other words, it's just an extension of mechanized production. How, how is this different from the assembly line? Well, that, I think that's the problem. That they're taking ideas and concepts that work on assembly lines in highly controlled environments right. and trying to apply those to the real world, the external environments, where, which is much more dynamic and chaotic. Right. And I think that's where things are going wrong. Right. And 
architecture control is a possible solution to that. So let's, uh, we don't need to have time for you to. Uh, yes, I'm yeah. just Carry thinking on. of lunch. So, so if, we, if we could hold questions so you could finish, and then we'll see what's left after. Okay. okay. There are, of course, autonomous vehicles about to arrive on our streets. simulation and they have some complex model of the world and they're moving this machine around within that sort of model and I think there's a lot more to driving than that. Now it's reported that uh, Waymo which is Google past uh, ordering like 62,000 more of these self-driving minivans uh, but they're also saying that to actually have one ourselves is going to be years away uh, the same publications are questioning the concept behind self-driving cars and in states within the next five to ten years they're going to be restricted to the highly controlled environments like college campuses and retirement communities. Okay, so some of the problems I see with the conventional way of doing things, but first let's, it's always good to laugh at some robots failing. <laughs> This is from the Dark Robotics Challenge in 2015. Like early flight. <laughs> so I'm 
there's loads of investment <coughs> going into robotics yeah. <laughs> and lots of hype about it, but I think the results have been sure. fairly disappointing. There's lots of questions about the viability of autonomous vehicles. Um, Amazon had the Amazon Picking Challenge, which was a competition uh, to get robot arms to pick things off shelves and put them on different shelves. And I think they've abandoned that because they just weren't getting the results they were hoping for. Uh, we've seen the Robot Chef, which is promising to cook loads of meals, but that had not uh, gone anywhere. Uh, there's a Jeevo, a social robot, which burned through $73 million of investment, but hasn't materialized. So, you know, if the, if the hype doesn't uh, come to a reality, um, with all the investments put in, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bursting of the robot bubble, similar to the uh, dot-com bubble, which we had in the mm. early 2000s. Um, okay, let's try a little experiment uh, for which I need someone to give me a hand. Rick, would you mind in your uh, in the audience participation room? I used to know to sit in the back. No, you're our experimental guy. Yeah. Okay, so all you need to do is uh, drink the beer. And this, this is the beer. Right? So I just want you to move the beer up to your. So which? I have a key cup. Now, if you stand next, next to me. So I want you to, uh, so the standard approach to robotics is to, is to program a set of instructions into the, into the robot. So I want you to imagine you are a vendor of the robot from Future Armour and you want to drink this beer. So you, you've been programmed to move your arm with a particular force of five on a scale of um, one to ten. Yeah, okay, it's water then. So you just you just move the bottle up to your mouth like that. And I'm going to hold my hand hand here, okay? And so, okay, three, two, one, go. Okay, that's fine. <coughs> uh, no. Okay, stop now. <laughs> hold it there now. Ow. Oh, okay. <coughs> yeah. So let's try try it one more time. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> okay, so why couldn't you do it that time? Because you are pressing on my arm. Okay, so there's a a disturbance to what you're doing and. So, uh, a disturbing force which you couldn't know about and couldn't compensate for. Right. Um, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> he just did. But, okay, so this time don't think about a particular <coughs> force, just think about the goal and apply whatever force you want to achieve the goal, right? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> okay, so there you were able to do it even though it was a disturbing force. Okay. Right, one more time. Uh, now, wait, hang on. <laughs> But this time, uh, don't apply any effort whatsoever, so no force at all. Okay? No, you're applying force oh, now. Hey. <laughs> Keep your arm completely relaxed. Then. Okay, three, two, one, go. Okay, so how much force were you applying then? Little. None. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Rick. Wow. I want a Rick robot. <laughs> a Rick bot. A Rick bot. Everybody. Yeah. Or your Rick robots. Right, right. So what was going on there? So the first time the robot uh, was able to achieve it, its task, it was carrying out its instructions. The second time it, it failed because it um, there was a disturbing force to what it was trying to do, which it, it didn't know about. The third time it achieved its uh, achieved its task because it was controlling its perception of the goal rather than just carrying out specific um, instructions. And the fourth time, even though it made no, no effort whatsoever, it still achieved its task because the environment allowed it to uh, achieve the goal. So uh, the environment does that sometimes. It, it helps you get the goal without any putting any effort into it, so effort into it such as you know, coasting downhill on a bicycle. So uh, it's not the actions that, that count, but it, it's the sort of goal of the systems trying to achieve. Um, so the reason that the second robot uh, worked is because it was a, uh, controlling its own perceptions. It was a perceptual control system, which the first robot wasn't. Uh, though with the, the standard robot, you could look at it as a perceptual control system, provided that you included the programmer as well. <laughs> Um, so the, the program is controlling their own perception of, and the robot is just a, the output part of the closed loop which includes itself. 
Um, but this doesn't work if there are unknown things in the environment, as we saw, uh, which is a lot of the time. And this is why robots don't work outside of the factory floor or the laboratory, uh, where the environment is highly controlled. So the challenge of robotics is to build robots that embody the goals themselves, and that can be done with perceptual control. Now, we look at the problems of something like filleting a fish, which requires sort of downward cuts and horizontal cuts. Now, if we use the conventional approach, how do we do it? Would we build some sort of model of the fish based on previous examples or based upon the actions that a, uh, a chef uses to fillet a fish? Well, let's have a look at what happens in the real. I'm going to lift the pectoral fin cut right under there and come right up underneath the collar, right to the spine. From there I'm going to stop, now I'm going to come to the tail and insert the blade right on the top part of the spine. Once you break through that skin it will go easy. This is a hatchery fish, you can see it's missing the adipose. I'm going to run right up the left side, right around the dorsal fin, right up the top of the fish, and I'm going to connect with that first cut that I made. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the backbone with this knife, and I'm just going to work my blade right down on the backbone, all the way down from the top of the fish to the bottom. Now I just cut through a series of bones, you could maybe hear them and I could feel them, called the lateral. What I'm going to do again is start again just like, like I did with the first cut, come right up underneath the collar. Now I'm just going to take the knife and cut and turn it. Now I'm just going to run it right down the spine, and I'm cutting through the, the meat and the bones as I go, being careful not to cut through the spine. You can see I'm staying on top of the, uh, the dorsal fin. I'm kind of letting the spine, again, be my guide. I'm going to go all the way down to the tail. Okay, so, he's doing two different methods there of cutting the fish. But, so initially he was starting off cutting down until he could feel, feel the backbone of the fish. So he's, until he, he's perceiving the actual the backbone of, through the resistance on the knife. And when he's making horizontal cuts, he's finding the backbone uh, with the knife, or when he's slicing through, as he says, he was using the, the backbone as his guide to go through. So in this sort of situation, there's so many in variables involved that you could only really do it with sort of uh, real-time feedback. And if you try to do, a robot tried to do this with some sort of model uh, of the fish, or based on the actions of a real chef, cook, uh, real chef uh, filleting the fish, I think the thing would just slice through the whole fish without, uh, you know, just go completely haywire. Even as a human, it's hard to do it because every fish is just a little bit different. Yeah. When you're modeling a, a, a two degrees freedom a robot arm, for example, the system would have to uh, embody complex mathematics of equations of motion and physical parameters such as the mass and gravity. And this doesn't really make sense with living systems, which means you couldn't do this on the moon or on, on the water. And when the degrees of freedom increase, this modeling problem increases exponentially. And the problem's even worse with a real arm, with more degrees of freedom, you have opposing muscles, and you're trying to transform, you, or if you did it this way, you'd be, try, you'd be trying to transform between things of very different domains, such as the tension in muscle fibers and the force to be applied by the arm. And it takes something very simple, like just holding my hand here, I happen to know that I'm applying a force of 9.87 meters per second, which is gravity. <coughs> Uh, but we don't do it by calculating what force should be, we just control our perception uh, of the hand. So we have to move it to where we want, just by controlling our perception. Um, in contrast to the concept of modelling, take something like driving a car. Uh, we control our heading by turning the steering wheel, we don't turn the, the wheel by a specific amount or uh, to a specific angle. And there's lots of things which can affect the, the heading of the car, um, especially wind. 
we don't really need to know anything about these risks. We counteract their combined effects by controlling the perception. And so, if you try to do it the conventional way of uh, building the transfer function between the steering wheel and your heading, you have to take all these things into account. So, I'd say there's no transfer function that could be modelled. Uh, not in practice, anyway, unless you're some sort of Laplacian demon that knew the entire state and dynamics of the universe. Now, you might say that this, this can work in sort of simulated environments, and that, that is quite true. In a simulated environment, you can control the um, heading of the car by this sort of mathematical approach, but that is because in simulation, we are acting as if we were Laplacian demons as is us who is defying the universe <laughs> simulations running. <clears throat> right. Robots based on PCT. Trying um, <coughs> to speed up. Um, so I built a, a software platform to try and develop uh, robotics based on perception control in, in a sort of graphical user friendly way of building up hierarchies of systems. And I think this could represent a step change in the way that robotics are developed. And uh, I call it the system Raptor. Uh, so here's, here's a, a basic system. This is one which I described in the paper which I mentioned earlier. It's very basic. Uh, it's got two motors and a light sensor and a proximity sensor. So the sensors are basically just two pixels. But because it has a perceptual control hierarchy implemented, it exhibits some relatively complex behavior, uh, such as controlling the sequence of things, such as searching for the maximum light, turning to the maximum light, avoiding obstacles. What's it doing now? What's it goal? Maximum light? Um, when it was turning, it was looking for the maximum light. Oh, it was looking for light. And correcting its uh, direction as it goes along. It can also uh, perceive uh, internal variables and control them, so that's a way of getting out of deadlock situations like this here. Oh, E. coli. Like an E. coli. That's what I was going to say, E. coli. The E. coli robot. Spinning. Mm -hmm. So. Here's a perception control hierarchy applied to a robot arm. This is a Bristol Robotics Laboratory, and it's doing Tai Chi movements. Uh, so this is a four-level hierarchy, I think, with sort of joints, uh, perception controls at each joint. And you'll just, you just provide this with the highest level goals of the X, Y, Z positions that you want the end effect to achieve. And it just moves to those positions dynamically. It's not doing any uh, kinematics or advanced computations of what the motion should be. It's just going to those uh, goal positions. Goal positions at the end of the arm? Yeah. So this is the little man without tracking. Yes. The smoothness of it compared to a typical robotic move is... It's doing gymnastics. Yeah. Does it get stronger? But it is smooth. Does it get stronger the more it pumps? Okay, and that, that's just the hierarchy. Each of those triangles are perception control systems. Um, so this is very similar. This is basically an implementation, an implementation of the arm control in LCS3. And here, here's a similar architecture, and this is where this is more like the little arm, where it's doing the visual tracking. So it's, it's got a um, camera in its wrist, so it's controlling the visual relationship between the itself and the target ball, <coughs> and the whole arm is moving, all the joints are moving. Snake like. Wow! Wow! And again, there's, there's no 3D transformations or kinematic <coughs> computations involved in this. Is. And I presume it would still work if you press down on its wrist. Okay. Um, 
it's controlling the positions of the limbs. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, why it's trying to track the ball. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay, then, and then a very similar architecture to the one previously, uh, but this includes the, the visual feedback, um, where it, and it's controlling the, uh, the, the wrist level, or, or the middle level here, it's controlling the uh, position of the target within the image. Sorry. The ball is the control variable. What are its components <coughs> that, that it's Perceiving. Uh, within the image, it's the x, y position of the ball within the within the image frame, so the pixel position. Um, and the so the the target, the image control system, sets references for the wrist control system, which moves moves the wrist to follow the ball, and then the, the other control systems uh, control the relationship between those joints and the wrist, so the whole arm. The, the number of programming statements for this compared to that inverse di you know, and dynamics with control of the means of freedom to be quite different? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, it, it's some of the research I want to do. And actually, the, the Amazon Research Awards project was about um, comparing this approach with control over over arm with a conventional approach. So that is one of the, the evaluation criteria that come out of that. Okay, so perceptual trophy can also be applied to autonomous vehicles, and it's the blue car, blue car here, which is controlled by perceptual control hierarchy, and it's controlling it. It's not doing any um, trajectory computation. It's not predicting future positions of where the other cars are. It's controlling the speed and proximity relationship between itself and the other vehicles. And the behaviour that emerges from that is of following overtaking and weaving in and out of traffic. About a month ago I came across this site, this site, Robot Benchmark.net, which has a number of simulated robot scenarios. And there's an inverted pendulum there. And the obstacle avoidance one, and you can go in there and program uh, solutions to it within Python. So I think people like Bruce and Rick might be interested in it. So it's quite a simple programming environment. You uh, buy these? Sorry? You buy these? No, you can do it online. <coughs> oh, you do them online. And you can also download the application as well and do it offline as well. <coughs> um, so this is uh, an example of the obstacle avoidance uh, task. So I, I programmed a uh, perceptual control system in, in this. Here is an example of it. And the, the objects of it are placed randomly each time it's run. So, this is basically, basically an implementation of the crowd mm -hmm. behavior hmm. task. Bill wrote the DOS crowd program in the late 80s. Right. That looked exactly like it. So, the goal here is just to cross that red line and do it in the uh, shortest time possible. Um, so you, you can go in there and put your own solution in and it will rank it compared to all other people. So I did this, and there's, for this task there's about 200 people um, did it. So would you like to, you know, work quite well. Would you like to guess where, where we got in the ranking for the perceptual control yeah. solution? Any guesses? Hi. Guess number one. Yeah. Would I dare come here? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are the others doing? They have to know where the obstacles are. So they're just looking at them and computing what to do? The, 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 the sensor on it is, um, so if you're looking down the robot, from the top view, uh, it's got a sensor, proximity sensors like that. Um, and it's only about uh, half, no, a quarter of a meter, the proximity that it's actually detected, and which is about the same size as the actual robot itself. So it's not looking very far uh, in front. So it's a bit different to the, the crowd behavior demo, because in, in that, um, 
Bill was able to perceive proximity to every other object in all directions at the same time. So those were the sensors that you put in on your <coughs> to create this uh, result? No, no, that's what they have built in this that's software. What, that's that's what, what they provide. Okay. Uh, so proximity missed. sensors that the simulation provides to you. So you just okay. read these sensors. So what piece did you add to create the program? Uh, the collision avoidance piece that well, from Crown? There's also a compass control, a compass sensor as well, so you can tell what um, direction you're going in, and the red line is at the bay of 90 degrees. So I think I had a two-level system where if you sort of detect, when you're controlling the proximity to an object and you change the reference for the compass control system. Okay, so you might have seen from the robots by Boston Dynamics, very impressive videos. Yes. I don't know how long this took to develop or how much how many millions of dollars they spent on it. So I've done something similar, which took a couple of days, and they did it in Lego. <laughs> so it works. Waking up. Get down on it here. Oh. Sorry. So that has the inverted pendulum yeah. uh, system implement on it. But I think the more interesting bit is the actual standing up, which is quite difficult to do because it's sort of not a mm. force required to stand up. Yeah. This is a Segway. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or a hoverboard. Um, so it stands up and balances uh, autonomously that I can sort of move it around the remote. So you're giving it a reference for location, or you're controlling its uh, uh, the speeds, the speeds of the wheels are just changing. Uh, so velocity, direction, and speed. Okay, now let's make a unicycle. So it got up by itself, and it's controlling its balance by itself. But you are putting where it goes by you. Yeah. And you should be able to add weights to it. So it's not, there's no model of the mass of the system or anything. So it shouldn't matter if you yeah. change the weight of it. So the, the force that required to stand up is generated dynamically depending on the environment. Okay. summary, as the lunch is probably ready. Um, <coughs> behavior is about the control of uh, control of input, control of perception, not about specific actions. Complexity comes from the hierarchy of these simple control systems. Conventional robotics for control of output approach is a misconception of what behavior is all about, and sort of modeling approach results in unnecessary complex systems. And I think it results in robotic systems where it's sort of inflexible and can't adapt to changing environments. Robotics based on perception control are based on simple universal principles, computation lightweight, and they're aimed at uh, autonomous goal-based systems that work in dynamic environments. And you end up with a radically different architecture for robotic systems compared to mm -hmm. conventional approaches. And I think it holds open the potential for, potential for psychologically advanced robotic systems. <clears throat> and it's a, you know, it's a scientific explanation of behavior. Where does sort of, uh, evolution by natural selection explain how living systems survive from generation to generation? Perceptual control explains how living systems survive within a lifetime uh, by perceptual control requiring enough energy to live long enough to procreate. Uh, in the face of a chaotic and 
unpredictable environment. <coughs> so it's a scientific explanation of behaviour. So it's somewhat ironic to be talking about it in this place, which is based on superstition and <laughs> ideology. <laughs> on the other hand, PCT, the PC explanation is about control of internal variables, such as the joy felt when watching the Blues Brothers, or the prejudice felt by some people, or personal identity. And these aren't things that actually exist in the external world. So I think it's quite consistent with PCT that people are motivated by things that don't exist. And for robots to progress to behave anything like humans, they'll have to act in a similar way. At the moment, robots are very dumb, and I hope to make them intelligent. Uh, but I do hope we can keep control of them, because there's only one thing worse than a dumb robot, and that's a robot with religion. <laughs> Therefore, PCT is not a religion. Is, there's only one thing worse than a dumb president, and that's the vice president. <laughs> so, before I came out here, my sister said to me, whatever you do, don't talk about religion and politics. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 A question here. Oh, right. okay. Yes. <laughs> Not yeah, yet. Okay. Is, is this the same robot that Bruce was uh, that was following Bruce no, with a, no. a sensor? No. No. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So there's one here that can follow. Be, yesterday we were talking about marketing kind of thing. Uh, one thing that really struck me is to put that on YouTube, but to add something like. Uh, a duckling following Tom and Lorenz. That was Bruce's uh, thing. But that sort of captures the imagination. Oh, okay, you know, that's, that's what's going on. Another piece of that, in my mind, is sort of the modeling piece with explicitly showing the limitations. So that one, presumably, would, as a model, would be falsified by table edges. Right? Because, you know, if you show it, it will fall off the edge. So that it's to say, yes, that model is possible that way, then add a visual piece like, I don't know, that it, that it stops at some kind of, you know, line along the edge. Death oh, perception. here it's no longer falsified. So I think those kind of layering can be persuasive kinds of things. So just, yeah, I think yeah. all these great things, but it's just that they take time yeah, yeah, and yeah. resources and funding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I don't quite understand why the autonomous vehicles are not perceptual control systems. They must be. They're working in a, an environment with well, all I kinds think, of... Well, you know, I think they are in some sort of explicit, uh, implicit way. Uh, but they're, they're more of a... Because they're sort of iterative, iteratively repeating what they're doing. So the, the data that they're taking is sort of updated as they move along. So I don't think... It doesn't, it's not sort of explicit perceptual They're control. not using control systems? They mean they have cruise control on every car. Yeah, I mean, cruise control is a perceptual control system. So they don't have analogous systems for all the other things they're doing to avoid objects and stuff? I can't remember. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think there is sort of overlap, but I think conceptually it's certainly different. And you know, if they're using this sort of model-based based approach, they're trying to sort of uh, predict what the outputs would be. And they get around, well, which is a sort of unnecessary, complex way of doing things. And they sort of talk about the prediction horizon of how far they can predict things in advance. And I think the more they reduce that prediction horizon to small amounts of time, they are actually getting to more being like a perceptual control system. And they don't know it. Hmm. Okay. Rick. This is okay. That was kind of going to be my question. Uh, with regard to the uh, Boston Robotics event, we did it. I mean, there, that's clearly uh, an inter control system. I, 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 okay, so I'm, my suggestion, which uh, is probably you can take or leave, but I think the, I would say the way to sell your uh, the, the PCT approach to robotics would be to. Uh, sell it in terms of, like you say, uh, uh, an approach to doing the engineering. Uh, because what, like, if, if you were going to develop a, a system to fillet the fish, uh, 
what you would want to do as the designer would be to try to figure out what perceptual variables you want the system to control and in what order and how, that kind of thing. In other words, your, your design would be oriented to understanding the whole process in terms of the controlled inputs. And I, and I think that is the, 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 the big, one of the big advantages because it, it's a practical advantage. Because even though these other <coughs> systems like the autonomous car and whatnot are implicitly uh, perceptual control systems because they do control some perceptual variables, what, what you can contribute is you can tell them here, well, first of all, you can tell them yeah, there's a lot simpler way to architect it. You don't have to put in all this yeah. predictive crap. And you can tell them how to <coughs> analyze the situation before they start wiring it up. And so that they know, okay, I gotta have a, these kind of sensors and I gotta develop these kind of perceptual functions uh, to do it. So that, that would be one thing. And the other thing I'll just say quickly, I, the reason I loved your paper, by the way, one reason is because it did, it also, another thing that it, it controlled a higher level variable, it controlled, controlled a sequence of actions, which is, uh, <clears throat> which is cool. I mean, presumably, if it was controlling that sequence, then if something happened to interfere with the sequence, it would presumably do, you know, backtrack or whatever to, to make the sequence happen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> That's another thing that would, I, I would imagine be useful to autonomous cars. It's not just about avoiding killing pedestrians. It's about, you know, uh, going places and, uh, you know, uh, following a, doing a sequence of things that, uh, that have to be perceived and make sure they're happening. And so anyway, but, uh, you know, but it's super great work. I just, uh, it's just a suggestion regarding how you might think about selling it. Yeah, that's, that's just, yeah. just very quick, uh, before we all run off to lunch, I do have this little thing here if anybody's interested. Uh, and after lunch, before we get started again, if anybody wants to see a demonstration of it, I can show you it and you play with it. I'd like uh, those who are, are interested to see if they can figure out how it works. Oh, what is the, what the, is the underlying control algorithm that's working? Oh. But uh, it will follow. <laughs> Rupert, I have a question. How many levels is the four level system? Is that as much as you've done at this point? Is a four level hierarchy? Yeah, about four. Uh, and it, it's quite laborious to do because you're trying to think about what the system has to control, has to control, what, the, what variables have to control, and then you sort of implement them uh, manually. So learning would be a real focus to get that to do. So it, it um, learn the control variables itself. Bye.